book of Esther. The book of Esther this morning. The book of Esther in your Bible. When you get to the book of Esther this morning, I'll ask you to stand this morning for the reading of God's Word. The book of Esther, chapter 1, verse 1. The book of Esther, chapter 1, and verse 1 this morning. Esther 1, 1. I'm going to read down through verse 19. Esther 1, 1 through 19. If you're not sure where Esther is, Esther is uh, it's right before Job and right after Nehemiah. The book of Esther this morning. One of my most favorite books in the Bible. I can sit and read the book of Esther. You can read it about an hour or two. And i tell you what, it'll... Bring on the waterworks for me every time I read the book of Esther. If you haven't read the book of Esther, by all means, take time and read it. It's just like reading a story. The book of Esther is. There's no begats and begat and begat, but it's all just a story is what it is. It's really easy to read, but it'll bless your heart when you read the book of Esther, I guarantee you. You don't even have to have a lot of biblical knowledge. That's why I'm able to read it. Now it came to pass in the days of Ahasuerus. This is Ahasuerus, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces. That in those days when the king Ahasuerus sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace, in the third year of his reign he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media. The nobles and princes of the provinces being before him, when he shewed the riches of his glorious kingdom and the honor of his excellent majesty many days, even a hundred and fourscore days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shishon, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white green and blue hangings fastened with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver upon pavement, pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law, none did compel, for so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. Also, Vashti, the queen, made a feast for the women in the royal house, which belonged to Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the heart of the king was married with wine, he commanded Mehuman, Bistha, Harbona, Bigtha, and Abag Ab Ab Agatha, the Zethar and Carthus, the seven chamberlains that served in the presence of Ahasuerus the king, to bring Vashti the queen before the king with the crown royal, to show the people and the princess her beauty, for she was fair to look on. But the queen Vashti refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. Then the king said to the wise men which knew the times, for so was the king's manner toward all that do law and judgment. And the next and the next unto him was Karshena, Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Maris, Marsena, and Mamakin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face and which set the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti according to the law because she hath not performed the commandment of the king Ahasuerus by the chamberlains? And Memucan answered before the king and princes, Vashti the queen hath done, not done wrong to the king only, but also to the princes, to all the people that are in the provinces of king Ahasuerus. For this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands and their eyes. When it shall be reported, the king Ahasuerus commanded Vashti, the queen, to be brought in before him, but, be in, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say today unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deeds of the queen. Thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath, 
If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come no more before the king and Hasherus, and let the king give her royal state unto another that is better than she. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, God, for this day. Lord, I just stand before you today, dear God, and I ask, oh, Father, that you'd help me. Lord, I need your help to preach this message today, dear God. I need your help. I need your guidance, oh, Heavenly Father. Lord, I believe you gave it to me for a reason, oh, God. But, Lord, I don't need to know your reason, but, God, I do need an unction, dear God, to preach. I do need your help and your power, dear God. Lord, help my, it not to be my words today, but your words that come from forth from my mouth, O oh Father. Help me, O oh Lord, to lift you up high and exalted, that people may see you. Hedge this place, dear God, from any evil spirit that may be here today. Hedge and bind the flesh of man today and woman alike, dear God, that they can hear your word. And God, we pray, Lord, that your spirit would be prevalent and fill this house today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. The book of Esther is a, a uh, I don't really know how to say this, so I'll just say it like this. In the book of Esther, you will not find mention one time of the name of God. The name, it's not in there under Yahweh. It's not in there under uh, Elohim. It's not in there under Eli. It's not in there in any form, shape, or fashion. You will not find the name of God. Not only that, but you'll not find the worship of God in the book of Esther. You see, in the book of Esther, the people are in a far away land. They've never, um, they've been taken captive. They were carried away by King Nebuchadnezzar probably about 70 years prior to the book of Esther. And they're in a foreign land. They've uh, seen kings and kingdoms rise and fall. They've been under the uh, captivity of numerous leaders. They've been under the captivity of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, of Nebuchadnezzar's son, of Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Then they saw the fall of Babylon. And they saw the rising up of the kingdom of Persia. And now they're sitting in what is known as the Palace of Shushan, which is in the modern day country of Iran, and it's positioned along the Persian Gulf. And the king in the power at this time is a Hasaros. You have to understand that they're in a foreign land with a pagan king, and they have pagan gods, there's pagan practices, and God is not mentioned any time in the book of Esther. But let me just say this. Even though God's not found in the book of Esther, even though God's not mentioned in the book of Esther, what you see throughout the book of Esther, starting probably in chapter number 2, and maybe even if you want to tie back in chapter number 1, is you can see the providential hand of God move throughout all the book of Esther. You see, what, what's going to happen is, is Vashti's going to be taken out as queen, and the king's going to need another queen. But before the king can have another queen, uh, there has to be somebody else come on the scene, and his name is going to be Mordecai. Mordecai has remained faithful to God, even though he's in a foreign land. And Mordecai is still serving God, even though he's in a foreign land. Mordecai has a niece or a cousin that is a little Jewish girl. Her mother and father have died, and she is an orphan. But God has blessed her with beauty. And what's going to happen is, is you're going to see a series of events in which Queen Esther, or Esther, is going to rise to become the queen. Mordecai is going to serve God. And while Mordecai is serving God, the devils that work too through a man named Haman, and this man named Haman, he's going to uh, cause a stir in the people, and he's going to try to commit genocide to wipe out the Jewish people. And God is still yet going to defend his people through a series of events, even though he's nowhere to be found. Aren't you glad today? 
that you serve a God that even though you can't see him, and even though you might not feel him, and even though it might be illegal to mention his name, is still working your life? Aren't you glad today to know that there's a God in heaven that's still looking down upon you even though you may think nobody knows where you're at? Aren't you glad today to know that you serve a God that just cares about you? Aren't you glad to know that you serve a God that still loves you? Aren't you glad to know that you serve a God who it doesn't matter what man says, praise God, he's still in control. He's still on the throne. He still has all power. He still has all glory. He still has all sovereignty. And nothing can stop his plan. Amen? Amen. But we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about chapter number one. And we're going to talk about this king and this queen. And God gave me this message. He had to because I could not come up with it by myself. And the message today is this. When God cannot be found. When God cannot be found. And we're going to look at a series of events. I, I, I ask God every week. I say, Lord, what, what is it that you want me to say Sunday? Sometimes I pray, God, give me your message for next Sunday. And I feel in my heart that God directed me to Esther chapter 1. I read it. I said, God, I got nothing here. I read it again. I said, God, I still got nothing. He said, keep reading. I had to keep reading. God, I've got nothing. I listened to sermons from different preachers. None of them preached on chapter 1. Zero. All of them went to chapter 4. And I was like, I've got nothing here. He said, keep reading. So I had to read. I read and read and read this until God finally gave me what I believe he wanted me to preach this morning. So we're going to talk about when God cannot be found. Okay? We're going to look at the life of this pagan king and the life, what life of his wife and the things that happened here. And I'm going to give you what God gave me this morning. So what happens when God cannot be found? Well, the first thing that I've seen that happens here is, is when God can't be found is man worship is promoted. Man worship is promoted. Uh, let me just say this to you. This, there is three things that the flesh, your flesh today, wants. You're born with it. You want these things. And here's what it is. You want prestige, which is wealth. You was born wanting wealth. You want power. Man desires power over other men. And you want praise. inside. Y'all, everybody likes to be clapped for people. But everybody wants power, praise, and prestige. It's inside of us. It's our nature. It's our flesh. So what's going to happen is, is the worship of man is going to be promoted here. Now, this isn't a strange thing. This isn't a new thing. As a matter of fact, if you go back and you read history, you'll find that the pharaohs, old down there in Egypt, their people actually worshipped them. They believed, now listen how ignorant this is. They believed that they were deity, and they actually intermarried within their family. You got me here? What's going on? All right. So pretty soon, everybody's like, "Why is the king crazy?" You got me? All right. So that promoted all the things that an incestuous lifestyle promoted, and that's what would happen to all their children. I mean, they're studying that today. And even up in, when you go forward in time, I mean, this is during the time of the Persians, but the time of the Greeks is about to come in the time of the Romans. The Romans believed actually that Caesar was God. You go on forward in time, go up to the 1940s, and you can actually look in Japan, and they believed that their emperor was God. They had emperor man worship. It happened. Is man worship still happening today? Well, sure it is. It's still happening today. Are there people that believe that uh, there is a man that's closer to God than you are? Well, sure there is. Is there people that believe today that there's a man that can absolve your sins? Well, sure there is. That's man worship is what there is. Let me just say something today. If you're saved, you're just as close to God as any other saved as far as your relationship to God. You're just as saved as anybody else. You're no more saved. Now, your fellowship, that's dependent upon you. But your fathership is sealed until the day of your salvation. So we got man worship taking place here in the book of Esther. So let's see, let's see what he does. Let's see what he does. Look at verse number four. 
when he shewed the riches of his glorious kingdom. What did I say every man wanted a minute ago? Prestige. What do they want? Money. So what's he saying here? He's saying, hey guys, come and look at all of my riches. I am King Ahasuerus. Now here's who he's got with him. He's got like his, uh, we'll call them dukes or uh, uh, we'll put it in American sense. He's the president and he's the governors, okay? And they're all sitting around him here. All seven of them are. And, and he's saying, guys, I'm so wealthy. Then praise God. I mean, he doesn't say praise God. But I'm so wealthy, but look at all these things that I've got here. So he has a big show. And he has everybody show off the king's riches. He shows all of his gold and all of his silver and all of his precious stones. And he's like, hey, look at what I... And here's how long this went on. It went on, if you want to go do the math later on, for 180 days. How long is that? That's half a year. Six months. For six months, he parades his wealth. Well, why is he parading his wealth? Because he wants everybody to know how rich he is. Hey, is that still going on in today's society today? Well, of course it is. It's still happening today. There's people today who build a house that they may not even see the all the rooms up still yet. And you know what's going to happen? They're going to get old and have a great big house they can't clean. <laughs> Come on now, I need a little help today. Is that going to, I mean, there's people today, I mean, I even heard about a preacher who's got a golden commode. What in the world, son? I mean, look what he's throwing in there. I mean, come on. But there's still people throwing around riches today. Is it still going on in society today? Yeah, it is. I mean, why in the world, and I don't mean to hurt no feelings today, but why in the world would anybody go buy a, a vehicle that costs more than eight farms? But it's still happening today. It's still going on today. People are parading their wealth. Why are they doing it? Because they want to be worshipped for their possessions. Yes. Look at what I have. And because of what I have, you should want to be me. Remember there used to be a, a sticker out when I was a young boy that said the one who dies with the most toys wins. Can I, oh, let's just go on, then I'll get to my point here. Next, look at what he does. In verse number four, it says, For his honor and majesty. Oh, here's what it says. Honor of his excellent majesty many days. In other words, he wanted everybody, and this majesty is going to carry on down. I'm just going to give you these two points at once. He wanted not only to be worshipped for his possessions, but he wanted to be worshipped for his prestige. He wanted everybody to see how much money he's got. And then he wanted to see everybody how much power, that's majesty, how much power he has. Is that going on today? Yes, it is. And your television is promoting your young children to think this way. Why in the world does it matter to us how much money a baseball team signs a pitcher for? Does it make a difference in your life? No. Does it change your life? No. But what are they saying? Look at what he's worth. Look at what he's worth because he can throw a ball. So what do all young children think? I want to throw that ball. What do they do? Well, they try to promote wealth. And here's what society tries to do today. It tries to tell you that the abundance of your wealth sums to the measure of the person that you are. And that's been going on for years and years and years. But let me just say something today. You're not measured in God's eyes by how much money you have. Amen. You're not measured in God's eyes by how much possessions you have. You're not measured in God's eyes by how much power you have. The only thing that matters to God is have you accepted or rejected His Son, Jesus Christ. The Bible makes it clear when it says plainly, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let me just say something today. Old King Ahasuerus here, he may have paraded all of his wealth. He may have showed everybody all of his money. He may have showed everybody all of his possessions. He may have sit up there and they may have said, oh, Ahasuerus, you've got such money. 
You've got such power. Man, you're just great. But let me just say something to you today, friend. When Ahasuerus shut his eyes in death, if he was lost, he's going to go to hell and all of his money ain't going to amount to deadly. It ain't going to make a difference. It doesn't matter because God's not worried about your money. God's not worried about your possession. But let me just go on and say something else today. Your money cannot bring you happiness. Your money cannot bring you happiness. Amen. 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 You're thinking, well, I sure would like to try. But no! <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's not going to make you happy. In Sunday school, we talked about people that were rich and powerful and who lived terrible lives about men who had to drink their meals out of straws because of the ulcers in their stomachs. Because once you get all that money, you're going to have to worry about, am I going to lose it? How fast does money go? Fast. And the more money you've got, the bigger risk you take and the more money you can lose. Friends, I, you never notice that we're living in a society today where you have to raise money to be president? I said we're living in a society where you have to raise money to be a president. Amen. That's true. That happens. And if you don't raise enough money, then here's what happens to you. The, the television cameras, they say, well, we ain't going to broadcast you because you're not rich enough to even make the run for president. That's the society that we're living in today. Today we've got sports players walking around here telling people how to live their lives who's never worked an honest day's work all their life. They don't know nothing about the life that you live. They don't know nothing about having to worry. Do you have enough money at the end of the week to pay the water bill? Are you going to have enough money to pay the doctor to take care of the baby? How are you going to have clothes on your back and food on your table? What are you going to do if your cow dies? They're not gonna have, they don't know nothing about all that stuff. And they're praying around here telling you, trying to tell you how to make decisions because they've got money. Well, let me just tell you something today, friends. There's somebody who can tell you how to make every decision you need to know. And he was unwealthy all of his life. He didn't even have a house to lay down in. He didn't even have a bed to lay his head up on. But let me just say something about him today. He wrote the greatest book that's ever been written. Amen. Amen. He died on the cross for you. Amen. Amen. He forgave you all of your sins. He knows all about you. He stepped out onto nothing and created everything just with the sound of his voice. And his name is King Jesus. And he ain't worried about the measuring you by how much money you have, how much possessions you have. All he wants from you is your love. Amen. His name is Jesus. So we see when God cannot be found, that man worship is going to be promoted. Let me help you out just a little bit today. Are we seeing more and more man worship in our society today? Yes. We are, aren't we? We're all not. So let's see what happens next. Man's woes are painful. When God cannot be found, man's woes are painful. Let's see what happens. Verse number 7. And they gave them drink and vessels of gold. And the vessels being diverse one from another. And royal wine in abundance according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel. Now here's what that means. I'm going to stop right here and tell you what this means. This means that nobody stopped you from it. Is what that means. I had to look it up. Nobody stopped it. And the king actually wrote a law that we're all going to drink. That's what that means. For so the king had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to the man's pleasure. In other words, here's what he's saying. He's saying, drink all you want. That's what he's saying. Drink all you want. Now, when God cannot be found, how many of you know that life, or I'm sorry, that in your life, your woes are still painful? Here's what I'm talking about. What did the king do? Let me, let me just, I'm going to get around the money. What did the king do? The king said, all right, so here's what we're doing. You all seen all the money I got? So now, here's what I'm going to do, boys. I'm going to break out the wine. I'm going to break out the wine, and we're going to drink as much as we can drink. Now, I don't know 
about you, but I kind of wonder about, uh, we'll just have to make up a name for somebody here. We'll call him um, um, him. And old him here, he's standing in the king's court, and uh, he's not a drinker, okay? He's not a drinker. But he kind of looks around, and he says, well, what's, well, what's the king doing? Well, the king, all of a sudden, he's funneling it down. Okay, well, what's a, what's old, I remember one of their names there, what's old Carcass doing? He looks over at Carcass and, ooh, he's putting her away too. And, oh, you know, I don't know what everybody's going to do if, if I don't drink. So here's what I, well, all right, here we go. I'll do this. Hey, how's it going, guys? I'm just holding my bottle here, all right? I'm, yeah. I'm a drinker now. I'm, I'm holding my bottle. And then pretty soon, what? You know, maybe everybody's going to notice that this thing's been full the whole time. So maybe I better just drink a little bit of it. So what's he do? Well, he drinks to be social. Why does he drink to be social? Because he's afraid what everybody else is going to think of him if he doesn't. He's afraid of what the king's going to say if he doesn't drink his drink. I mean, the king wrote a law and said, boys, drink whatever you want to drink. And so now here's old him. Remember our guy him? He's not a drinker, but now all of a sudden he is a drinker because he feels the pressure of society on him. He's worried about what everybody's going to think about him if he doesn't do it. You see, when God cannot be found, the increase of alcohol consumption is on the rise because the woes of society are still in place. They're, they're still feeling the pressure to do those things. Is that happening in our world today? Well, sure it is. Sure it is. Now think about this just for a moment here. Here's what they're saying. Think about this. Now here's what old King Ahasuerus is saying. And you're going to make, I want you to draw a relationship to it in society today. Here's what old Ahasuerus is saying. We're having a big time here. Six months we've looked at my money. Six months we've looked at my power. But you know, we really can't have a good time unless we tap a keg, boys. We can't have a good time unless we bust a bottle. It's still going on in our society today. You can't have a good time unless you just get dog-faced drunk. You can't have a good time unless you drink. You can't have a good time unless you put on some alcohol. And here's what it amounts to. In other words, it's saying this, really. It's saying you can't be happy unless you're getting loaded. At one time, I had that mentality. At one time, I thought in order to have a good time, when I was over in college, I thought, well, you know, I, I'm going to, mom and dad ain't around, because Lord, they beat me half to death. Mom and dad ain't around, I'm going to drink, and I'm going to show everybody what a drinker I am, and I'm going to show everybody how I can drink, and uh, look at me in society now, all of a sudden, here I am, ain't I cool? You know, Rick Joe, what you are is a fool. And let me just say something to you today. I never, and I'm going to need some help if any of you all know what I'm talking about, found happiness from getting drunk. I found misery from getting drunk. I found puking my guts out from getting drunk. I found ruining relationships from getting drunk. I found on the edge of murder from getting drunk. I, I even hate to tell this on myself, but I woke up in the road before at 3.30 in the morning. I didn't know how I got there. I woke up in other cities, in other states. I didn't know how I got there. And I thought I had to do it to be happy, to be cool. But I'm so glad today that I can be happy without any alcohol in my life. I'm glad today to know that I can gather in a place where there's happy people and we can have a happy time. We may act like we're drunk. People may think we're drunk. You say, Brother Joe, what are you talking about? I'm talking about go back and read over there in the book of Acts when the Holy Ghost of God fell down upon the upper room and everybody was the same. Well, hey, they're all drunk. And Peter stood up and said, we're not drunk. It's an outpouring of the Spirit. Praise God, there's happiness in the name of Jesus today. And I don't need alcohol to do it. Amen. Well, not only, you know, and here's, here's how I come up with this today on this, all right? 
I, I looked at all that drinking and I thought, well, what is it that promotes people to drink? What is it that causes people to drink? And you know, there's actually been studies done on this. How many of you know you Google something automatic expert? But there's studies that's been done on this. And I had to look it up and there's a group of people that sit down, it was a, it's a medicinal group, it's not WOE or nothing like that. But they study why people consume alcohol. And here, there's two reasons, two, you know, there's other little reasons, but the most statistical big reasons are this. Social peer pressure is number one. Number two is relief of stress. Yeah. Relief of stress. And they say that people that are social peer pressured into drinking, uh, they're not as at greater risk of becoming an alcoholic, but they still stand a chance of becoming an alcoholic. But there is a higher risk of people becoming an alcoholic who drink for the reason of relieving stress. So I asked myself this question. I said, now, Brother Joe, why is it that the king says in this last verse, according to every man's pleasure? Well, we're just going to have to ask, oh, uh, oh uh, let me just find somebody's name here. We're going to have to ask, oh, me human. We'll, we'll say something like this, me human. We're going to ask me human. Me human, why is it today, buddy? Um, you know, I see you're over here in the king's uh, uh, palace, and, and son, you're knocking them down. You're sitting up and knocking them down. What? What's going on with you there, me human? He says, well, me just human. No, uh, here's what he says. He says, um, well, you know, uh, um, him, here's what's taking place. Uh, uh, I've got all these bills, and I don't know how to pay them. Um, my wife is constantly on me to build on, and I don't know how I'm going to pay for that. I don't, I don't know how we're going to do that. Um, I've got these guys that work for me, and I cannot get them to do what I want them to do. And I'm afraid that the king is going to find out what I've been doing and having to cover up my financial standards, and I'm afraid he's going to come down on me. So I've got, you know, I've just got a little time here, him. I've got a little time, and what I'm going to do is, is I'm just going to take this, this couple weeks here, and I'm just going to get as drunk as I can because I know when I'm as drunk as I can, I don't have no more worries anymore. People are doing that today in society to get away from their problems. But let me just say something to you today, me human. Me human, when you sober up, I'm going to need some help here, church. Your problems are still there. Amen. They have not went away. But let me just say something. Can I, can I just act this out? Me human, I just want to tell you something. I, I heard of a man, and he said, uh, uh, cast all your cares upon me. Well, that didn't work very good over here. Uh, me, human, I know a man said, cast all your cares upon me. Amen. Come unto me, all you, all ye that are heavy laden. Amen? Amen? And I will give you what? Rest. Rest. Rest for what? Rest for your soul. Can I tell you something today, friend? Not only is there happiness in the name of Jesus, not only is there peace, but there's peace in the name of Jesus as well. In other words, there's people that's out there drinking today because they have no peace of heart. Can I tell you something today? You can find peace of heart in the name of Jesus. Amen. No matter what's coming down the pike, no matter what's around the bend, it may hurt you and it may struggle you on for just a little while, but honey, you can throw back to your shoulder, stiffen up your back and stick out your lip and say, I know one thing, neither height nor depth nor power, principality, nothing can separate me from the love of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Nothing can tear me away. No man can pluck me out of his hand. No matter what the world throws at me, I may not be able to pay my bills. They might come and get my house. My wife might give me the boot and throw me out the door. I might have to walk down the road half naked with nothing on my back, but praise God! That stuff to shout about right there, you know. And not only that, but one day they're going to take this old body, and there's going to be they're going to fill it full of some kind of fluid. Not that it's full enough, and they're going to fill it some kind of full of fluid, and they're going to throw it in old casket, Uncle Dan. And I've been, I've seen a lot of, a lot of funerals. I've had, I had to stay in there at the end all the time, and, and it's so, so heartbreaking. 
They crank that old casket down and they close her up and then they lock her down. That's going to happen to me one of these days. But it is. I'm going to close my eyes and death one of these days. But you know what? Even when I'm laying there and that old body's in that dead and decaying state, it's going to be laying there, but my soul's going to be with King Jesus. Amen. 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 And one day he's going to part the eastern skies and he's going to give a shout. And my soul's going to hit smack back down back towards that body. Whammo, it's going to come in there and that body's going to be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. And all of a sudden there ain't going to be no grave. worry about despair. You don't have to worry about doom if you got Jesus in your life. You know, let me just say this. And I need to get away. Oh my word. <laughs> I didn't realize it was so late. Y'all hang in there, alright? I ain't eating nothing. Oh Lord, I had a bite to eat. I promise y'all I've drank that bottle of water and I'm fine. I drank a cup of coffee out. Two, three cups of coffee. But, but I'm all right, okay? I hope you are. Let me just say this. They need to show alcohol commercials in reality. They need to show my old uncle that I used to have, amen? He used to get in a bad way, didn't he? They need to show him what happens when people get drunk. I, let me just, here, here, let me give you this example today. I see a man one time. I was about 16 years old or 15 years old. Come down to my dad's junkyard in the middle of winter. There was a snow on about this deep. Came down to that junkyard. Had a little Ford Fairmont, a little white one. I still remember the car, a little four-door. And that man had been laying in that car, parked out around the front of Oak Ridge Church up that road for over a week, cuddled up with a 40-pack of beer. And he would drink enough to pass out. And then when he would come to, he would drink enough to pass out. And then when he'd come to, he'd drink enough to pass out. And he was cuddled up with that alcohol. And he'd come down there to the junkyard. He had on an old pair of slippers. He had on an old tattered shirt. His blue jeans had holes in them. And I knew him because I knew he was a drunk. And friends, I'm telling you the truth. And he got down in that snow, and he laid down on his side, and I had on coveralls. And he commenced to puke. And he puked white foam all over the place down there, and laid on his side and shook like a dog. And I said, Dad, he's going to die on us. Dad said, there ain't nothing I can do. I said, well, you need to do something. <laughs> so we did something. You know what we did? We bought his car. Somebody come down there and picked him up, took him to town, and he spent that money on more alcohol. Mm -hmm. They need to show that in commercials. Yeah. Dad said, I said, Dad, if we buy his car, he's going to go get more alcohol. He said, son, if we don't buy his car, somebody else is going to. It's true. That man's dead now. He lost his life. I hate it for him. I hope he got saved before he did, but Sure, it did look that way. That's what they ought to show now. Alcohol for us. Guys, I gotta go on. I gotta give you the rest of this, but I'll hurry. I promise I will. All right, so old King Ahasuerus is drunk. Look what it says there in your Bible. It says that he's merry with wine. Okay, it says that right there in verse number 10. And I want to show you what it is. Okay, next, what he does is he says, Go get Vashti. Go get Vashti. All you men, go get Vashti. Bring her. That's his wife. Bring Vashti out here and have her put the crown on and have her put her royal apparel on. And boys, if you think my gold was something, if you think my money was something, if you think my, my wine was something, wait till you get a load of this baby doll that I got. Yeah. And you bring her out here and you let her dance around. That's more or less is what he's saying there in the Bible. You go back and study it. What's he saying? He said, go get Vashti. Bring her out here. You let my wife dance in front of you men. So they, they don't get bashed in. I said, yeah, Vashti, come on. You got to dance in front of us. Vashti says, no. So what happens is, 
is the king writes a law, and the king says, all right, Vashti, you know, dance for us. You make a fool out of me in front of my friends, and here's what I'm going to do. You ain't no longer mine. Get out of here. So he oppresses her, and then his marriage is over. Again, i got four points for that. When God cannot be found, men and women have problems. Can I get an amen in the house of God today? Amen. When God cannot be found, women become an object. When, when God cannot be found, wives become obstinate. When God cannot be found, wives face oppression. When God cannot be found, marriages are over. Let me just show you what I mean by that this morning. All right, so here's King Ahasuerus, and here is all of a sudden his opinion of his wife. She's no longer the woman that he is joined to together forever, but she's an object of sex before his eyes. And she says, all right, now, you go get my object and you parade her around in front of all my men so they can see who I'm, I'm sorry, so they can see who I'm sleeping. And that's what's going on there. And lo and behold, she says, I'm not doing it. She said, if that's all you think of me, then I ain't going to do it. And then lo and behold, what does he say? He gets mad, so what does he do? He says, well, I'm through with you. And that's what happens. In that Let me just say something to you today, okay? When God is not in a marriage, then things go awry quickly. We're living in a society today where God is being harder and harder and harder to find. Can I get a witness on that this morning? And where women become objects. Amen. Amen. They, they teach little girls to parade around to nothing all day and then wonder why in the world we have high, high pregnancy rates and wonder why we have high abortion rates. Well, my lands, look at what you're doing, ignorant. Am I right about it? Amen. Do we have a high divorce rate in our society today? Yes, we do. And do you know when we the, the divorce rate went wild in America? When pornography became illegal. Right. Or legal, I'm sorry. And it went straight through the roof. Because all of a sudden, two flesh don't become twain. All of a sudden, men are taught to feed their flesh and their appetite. And they're getting married for the wrong reasons. People are getting married because they're in lust and not in love. There is a huge difference. Lust is no different than two, top, two cats in the back street. Love is when you love somebody. There has to be three people in a marriage. Three. Amen. The man, the woman, and Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what God made. That's what God ordained. That is the institution of marriage that God gave us in the Garden of Eden. And let me just go on and say this. This may sound cheap and corny, but it's true. He made Adam and Eve and not Adam and Steve. Amen. Amen. And we've disgraced marriage today. Yes. We've torn marriage apart today. We can't understand what's going on. But let me just say something to you today and then wrap all this up. I can tell you today that you can have a happy marriage. You can marry the person that you love more than you ever loved in your life. Carson, one of these days I pray to God, and son, I'm praying for you, and I'm praying for my kids, and I'm praying for your kids, and, I, and kids, I'll start praying for you as well, that God sends you the person that you're supposed to have one of these days. Amen. Because let me just say something to you, little boys. There is nobody who can understand you greater, who can make you happier than the, than the woman that God has designed for you. Amen. Come on! Amen. And girls, there's nobody who can make you happier than the man that God has designed for you. But praise God, there's happiness in marriage today. I know that I wouldn't be anywhere without my wife today. She ain't up here, but she supports me in all that I do. She stands behind me. I can tell her, honey, I'm going to sell our house and move us in a camper out on the ridge somewhere with no electric. And she'd say, well, if that's what you think we need to do, and she'd do it with me. You want to know why she does that? Because she loves me. 
But you want to know another thing? I wouldn't do her that way. You know why? Because I love her. And I don't want to see her go through that. There's happiness today in marriage, but it can't happen if God ain't made it. There's happiness today in life, but it can't happen if God ain't tamed. There's happiness today in society, but it can't happen if God cannot be thanked. So I want to ask you a question real quick. If your head bowed and your eyes closed, I want to dismiss. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Nobody looking around this morning. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Can you find God in your life? Is He in there? Is He in your life? If Jesus Christ is your Savior today, would you just raise your hand and put it up, up and back down? If Jesus Christ is your Savior, just raise your hand and put it back down. I'd ever hand in this place today. Because God can be found in your life. Now, if you I didn't get to see everybody, but if you weren't able to raise your hand today, would you just do it right now and say, God cannot be found in my life? Is there anybody today? God cannot be found in my life. I'm not saved. Is there anybody here today? I'm not saved. One hand, two hands. I'm not saved. Anybody else? Another hand went up today. Anybody else? I, I'm not saved today. Now, if you raise your hand and you said you're not saved today, then by all means, why don't you give your heart to Jesus today? God's dealing with your heart right now. He's giving you the awareness of mind to understand that. You know you're not saved. Why don't you let today, June the 27th, be the day that your life has changed forever. Why don't you just come forward right now and accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Nobody's looking around. Nobody's, nobody's looking at you. You don't have to worry about anything else. All you need to worry about is, is God dealing with your heart. Why don't you come right now? Get out of your seat right now. Why don't you leave these troubles and trials and come up right now and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Right now, why don't you give your heart to Jesus? Why don't you find the peace and the happiness that I'm talking about today? Is there anybody? Would you come right now? I know there's people here today that's not saved. Friends, I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I wouldn't do that. I would never even let anybody know that I know. But I can tell you this. God loves you and wants to change your heart. He wants to give you a brand new life today. Why don't you do it right now? Right now. Why don't you come and give your heart to Jesus? Can you do it? Can you do it right now? Is anybody in that you raise your hand and you know you're not safe? Just say, remember me in prayer. Just put your hand up, put it back down. I won't come to you. I'll just pray for you in my time faithfully. Thank you for that hand today. Anybody else? Remember me in prayer. Remember me in prayer. Put your hand up, that down. Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? Remember me in prayer. Remember me in prayer. All right. Let's all stand this morning. Yeah, right. Head open, head up, and eyes open. Folks, I want to apologize to you for a couple things this morning. Um, I apologize for taking so long. I do. I, I apologize for it. I don't mean to keep. I'd love to get y'all out of here by twelve fifteen every day, but it just don't happen for me. And I apologize. It's it's twelve forty five. I'm sorry for it. Don't 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 cast me aside because of it. it any little ears up here, mom or dad, if I said something that was offensive this morning, I'm just trying to just pour out what God gave me today. But uh, thank you all for your time and attention this morning. Thank you all for coming out here in the Word of God today. And remember, um, if you're going to come next Sunday night to the fellowship meeting, by all means, see me at the church. Just, just, just say, yeah, I'll come that way. I can jot your name down and... Uh, and that way we'll get together and I'll know what all is going on in the church, okay? Is that good with everybody? All right. Um, Lord, uh, Isaac, is that your name? Would you run downstairs there and uh, tell... Uh, oh, never mind. Let's just all bow our head and close our eyes this morning. Um, let me see here. Uh, anybody want to dismiss us today? Anybody want to volunteer to dismiss us? Tom, you want to dismiss us?